with the USA women's volleyball and uh, they had gone through 13 tries, 13 quadrennials where they got very close, uh, multiple bronze. They got a uh, multiple, they got a silver and uh, they couldn't get over the hump. And yeah. I was asked to come in to help with the team cohesion. Now it's very challenging, right? You got the best in the world. They're ranked one, two, three in the world every year. The sport of volleyball has been around in the Olympiad for 60 years. But then in the same breath, we're going to say, but you also have to give to each other. Very, very similar to corporate America. We're all marching on your numbers. Q1, Q2, Q3, hit your numbers. But I need you to be a good teammate in the office. And so how do we navigate all that? Well, number one, we got to be uber clear on what we're saying as a company. We're all going to strive to be minute by minute, day to day. And how do we hold each other accountable? And how do we celebrate those performance skills and those relationship skills? Great culture is driven by two levers. How we perform, KPI, Q1, Q2, Q3, straight rigid excellence doesn't negotiate. Here are your numbers, all right? We're not going to wiggle around it. You're not hitting your numbers. The other lever is relationships and how am I communicating in conflict, in celebration, and in support and loyalty to my teammates? on a day-to-day -day basis. Welcome to AFO Wealth Management Forward, a podcast about finance, accounting, technology, and entrepreneurship. We apply our decades worth of experience and insight into what makes businesses work so we can help others grow both personally and professionally. In this ever-evolving marketplace, we help accounting firms and financial advisors grow their practice through the adoption of holistic wealth management services. Learn from industry leaders and subject matter experts to unlock the secrets of their success. A podcast that shows people and companies the transformative power of technology so they don't fear it, but instead harness it. Don't fight the robots, team up with them. And here are your hosts, Rory Henry, Director of Business Development and CEO Rob Santos of Arrowroot Family Office. All right, hello everyone. Today I have a guest co-host, Don Broll and the designated motivator, Don. Thank you for joining me. Rory, it's an honor to anything to do with you. You have the same energy <laughs> as I do. I like I already have goosebumps and feel like I'm going to explode before we even get started. So well, thank you. I don't know if the internet has bandwidth to contain the amount of enthusiasm that is about to occur because we have a very special guest with us today. I'm going to introduce her. She is has been a student, a coach and administrator at UCLA for over 45 years. She's an 11 time national champion. She's currently teaching leadership and development at UCLA. She's the founder and CEO of One Softball. She's also a renowned public speaker, an avid surfer. Uh, I couldn't be more pleased to have her with us today. I know her as coach. Uh, I want to welcome her to the podcast. Sue Inquist, coach, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. I look forward to being here. Yeah. So let's get started here. I always like to get a background uh, for our audience on our guests. I know you've had some phenomenal uh, teachers, uh, people that have influenced you, your parents, Coach Wooden. Can you give a little bit of background on who you are, Coach? You know, when you're born, did you come out of the womb throwing the softball and giving a motivational <laughs> speak to the hospital staff? <laughs> You know, I first should just start off by what I'm not. I think a lot of people know my bio, but let me tell you what I'm not. I was told in elementary school that I had reading deficiencies and had to read from the special books. I was told in high school I'd never make it at UCLA. But what the difference was, I was surrounded by amazing leaders. My father, I'm a daughter of a World War II veteran, a two-time Purple Heart. So I learned very early on around the rigors of excellence, but I also... I'm a daughter of a nurse and my mom taught me to never judge other people's shoes unless you've been in them. So that was really my drip, drip, drip influence growing up. And the greatest leaders that I had outside of my, my family, my mom and dad, my brother and my sister, probably were my brother's little league coach, John Springman, to Joe Clutie, my baseball coach that got me to UCLA. Sharon Backus, who was my coach at UCLA, and then, of course, John Wooden. Those are really those people that I feel like I had a, uh, a profoundly affected me and allowed me to, I think, get pretty close to being my best self, but more importantly, remembering that there's always work to do, uh, even at the age of 64 now. <laughs> 
I can't believe it. I can't believe it. I know Don wants to jump in here. She's chomping at the bit. Uh, Don, why don't you go ahead and fire away? Yeah, so I'm I'm obviously super honored to be here, but my name is Don Brolin, and I've I've been working in the accounting. You probably ask yourself, what's Tally for? Well, Tally for is a tax flow that empowers firms to automate the tax trial balance, saving them hours per return in three easy steps: import, adjust, and file. Import. Tally for accepts data from all major accounting systems. Adjust. Your accounting and tax teams can collaborate to make all the necessary tax-based adjustments. And file. Once the tax trial balance is completed and approved, Tally4 can send it to any leading tax product. Tally4's import, adjust, and file process will help you reduce the time it takes to create a tax return from hours to just minutes. To learn more about using Tally4 for your CPA firm, head over to tally4.com. That's T-A-L-L-Y-F-O-R.com. Space for 23 years, and it was I knew at 16 years old that's what I wanted to do. Uh, I, sports and accounting never were things that were talked about together. It was always physical education, or you know, going to go into coaching or whatever it may be. But accounting wasn't really lining up with coaching or, or any of that stuff. But but I learned the biggest and best lessons I learned through my athletic career. I mean, I learned throwing a bat against the backstop is not a good idea. So that was a really great lesson. Like you know, you probably should be a little nicer to the umpires as opposed to, you know, wanting to kill them and stuff like things, just simple little lessons that we learn through life. But I really feel like that experience through sports. And of course, my dad was a big influence on me. He, he was a supervisor at Pratt and Whitney and, and he was during the times of strikes, like they used to do real big strikes. You know, they were doing all the, all the engines for major planes and even for the wars and things like that. And he would stay over at night sometimes and he wouldn't cross the picket line because he didn't want to insult the guys that worked for him. He was like, I'm not going to cross over across from them. He would sleep on a cot at his office. And so I learned the commitment and the loyalty that you have to the people around you, especially when you're on a team, which he was the leader of the team as the supervisor, for him to walk across the line like that would have really been detrimental to his team. And so he taught me that, how important that was. And of course, my career at Eastern Connecticut, and we, you know, we were, we were always in the national tournament. We were division three, but we were always in the national tournament. We won, you know, the national tournament my sophomore year. And my, my coaches taught me that commitment to each other. So move that to the accounting industry. And think about those of us who are leading teams, you're leading teams. I have a team, only a team of three plus myself, but understanding that those leadership skills that I learned in athletics for me. I carry into my firm and I know I've got to be the first one at practice on the first one in the office. You know, those things are still things that are important, but for me, the motivation, the designated motivator is to encourage and motivate. I have a staff guy right now. He's a 24 year old. I got him a job at the IRS criminal investigation because that was his passion. So he hasn't, he hasn't left yet. So he's still here, but I, I wanted him to do the things he was so passionate about and it just didn't fit that he would stay with me. Like he was meant to be somewhere else. So sometimes leaders are able to take people and, and learn about what their passions are and grab them and send them where they belong and it may not be with them. And that's okay. Yeah. Yeah, I would love to get into Sue. I know I, I watched some of your videos here, the uh, being an engineer of belief. And, and being that leader, can you kind of talk to our audience about what that means and how we can help people uh, believe in themselves? Sure. I think want to give a little bit of context if, if you're out there as a listener and you've been in the industry for, you know, 10, 20 decades, you are experiencing what I call a renaissance, that it appears like the rules are changing a little bit or the standards Um I want, to, I want to clearly define the difference between a standard and a rule. A standard is how we do things. It's almost a social handshake amongst colleagues, coworkers. Rules are more rigid. They're black and white. If you break them, you get punished. But I feel like the standards are changing a little bit in that we know if you've been in this game for a while, you'll notice that the people that you um, that are working for you, if you're a boss out there, You'll notice that they want much more engagement. They want much more autonomy at the same time. So they want to be they want to be able to come in, do the work on their own time, but they also want access, they want access to the CEO. So it can be very confusing as a, a veteran leader. So I want to speak speak to them first. The quickest way for you to have more joy and peace of mind to me, the 
the apex of being your best self is actually finding peace of mind in everything that you do believe and execute. And if you can gain that peace of mind by having a, an awareness of not so much who you are, what you do, I'm hoping everybody follows, but more about every single day when I go into the office or I go into the Zoom, I'm a constant listener first. And that's new for traditional leaders. Uh, I grew up in a very vertical leadership environment. I never questioned anything. I just did it, did it at 100%. Today, it's more transformative. The leader today, whether you're 60 or you're 30, the environment is asking today's corporate America, education, government, whatever you're in, sports, they're asking that the teacher and the follower, the student, the athlete, they actually work together in this journey together. And how do you do that? You have to ask a lot of questions first. Let your employees and coworkers go ahead and define what their thriving environment feels like. Remember thriving, that word is defined as grow vigorously. So we have to make sure the words that we use are actually all on the same page of the person that's listening to them. So for me, if I were in corporate America today, I would not coach or train or lead the way I did when I coached 15 years ago. Very authoritative, very rigid, very, very inflexible. Today, I would literally have those design vision meetings and have them feel like they are a part of what this best world looks like. They would be a part at signing off on what the KPIs are. These key performance indicators, hold your breath forever unless you have something to say right now. What do we need to do left or right on our KPIs? And can you sign off on those? Now you have employees and colleagues that were a part of the process from start to finish. Then my job becomes catch them doing it right every day. Catch them doing it right every day. And then to take their, what I call their emotional temperature every day. And I can sense somebody is high and low. I've got to feed them with a renewed sense of enthusiasm. I have to feed them with a renewed sense of hope by identifying their inventory or their skills that got them to this point. Because we know excellence can kick you in the stomach. Going to the top and striving to get to the top is really like a game of tag and you're always it. And as the leader, you've got to remind them next play, next client, next you know program, that next play mindset to constantly be moving. And once they start to own that language, that self-regulation, and you're helping them, catching them doing it right every single day, keeping an eye on all the little things, you're going to start to build an environment where they feel responsible for their culture. And where it gets a little provocative is I'm not a big believer in leader-driven cultures. I'm a big believer in player-driven cultures today and colleague-driven cultures where the leader actually lets go of the steering wheel and hands it over to their team so you get greater engagement. Yeah, and we were talking prior to, to recording here about the, the Gen Z and this new generation of kids, Coach, on, and how we can better operate and, and work with them. Can you kind of talk about some tips? Cause you work with a lot of youth out there and kids at the college uh, level on, on what they're really looking for from their leaders in regards to uh, uh, going on the workforce. Well, if you're, you know, if you're a mom and dad or brother, sister, aunt, uncle that has a youngster that is playing youth sport. The reason I started one softball was I was interested in closing the education gap because no one is giving the sport parent a vetted and verified path to college or path to corporate America roadmap. The parent doesn't know where to get trusted information. So I said, I'm gonna spend three years, I traversed the country and interviewed 30,000 softball families. And it came down to three things. The youth coach, let's remember, that's the mom or dad that raised their hand and said, I'll volunteer to help, all right? So all you parents sitting there complaining about the coach, shut your pie hole. Okay. Number two, <laughs> the, the student athlete. I, that's a great, I love that line. Yeah. Well, it's the truth. I'm retired. So yeah. I'm going to be a truth teller today. That's right. Let's, let's remember they are volunteers, people. Now you want to complain about me as a college coach. I'm all for it. I'm working right. full time. 
That's a mom. It's a baker. It's a banker. It's a nurse. It's a teacher that raised their hand and said, I'll give an extra 30% of my time to help these kids hopefully have a good experience. The mom and dad's biggest complaint, they don't know who to trust to get it, to get their athlete good instruction. And then the coach that's out there, the volunteer, the coach doesn't know where to get the technical information. So the mom and dad need organization, the coach needs technical, and the athlete needs a little more fun zone. So -hmm. those parents out there, if you really like parents come to me all the time, like, what do I need to do? It's just so crazy. And we feel like as a family, we know what we're doing. I go, you know what you need to do? Go to Costco, buy two beach chairs (laughs) and park your butt in right field and get out of the noise called the bleachers. If you want to have your kids have a great experience, turn that game over to them and let them have a valuable two hours of just kids being kids. And to the mom and dad, whoever's driving and does the post game, break it down in the car, put your hands at 10 and two and enjoy the silence. Don't talk about the game, especially if you're coaching or have parents that have girls that are playing. A lot of times they just want to put their earbuds in and listen to their music. Absolutely. All right. Yeah. Dawn, do you have anything to add on that? I know you're a coach and you deal with a lot of these young women out there. I do. I mean, how can I possibly follow up some anxious <laughs> request, Rory? And that's not fair, but I, I, I definitely, as I'm, you know, I'm a volunteer coach, like I'm as a D3, I'm a volunteer because I'm passionate about the game. I'm passionate about my, my alma mater, where I learned all these skills that I have to live and survive in this culture. Yes, I know I'm changing. I'm, I think maybe I'm a little bit, um, have a little bit more of an advantage over a lot because I have a 23 and 24 year old daughters. So I, I get them, right? So that's my thing, I get them. And so I have that motherly aspect to it. So, you know, I do find, and I, I listen to these kids and that's, Sue is so 100%, whether I'm in the office listening to my staff or I'm on the field listening to these players, these athletes, these wonderful young women, we're, I'm still behaving the same way both places because I have to listen. And I've lost key employees where I didn't do a great job of listening. I was a bad leader. I did not listen. I wanted to, like Sue said, I want to be in control. I need you to do this. And they're people pleasers as much as I am. They're going to do it. But after a while, they're not, they don't want to, that's not what they signed up for. They didn't sign up to be my secretary. They signed up to be an accountant yet I'm having them do scheduling or what I'm just using as an example, but the listening is so important and things have definitely changed. Like I had no problem getting in the car and have my, I mean, my dad, for the most part, I didn't, I don't think I got all, he, the umpires took the slack. <laughs> from my dad, right? I didn't take too much of it. So, you know, as we are going and it's so true and that's hard for people our age, I'm just going to say, like I said, it's my birthday, 52. <laughs> so I'm not hiding it. Right. But I'm 52, man. I I would have really struggled with this transformation into listening and listening as a leader and not talking all the time and being the one making all the decisions. And, and Sue's 100% correct. These kids want to be in control. They want to understand why. Why are you telling me to do it this way? Just like another employee that may come from another firm. Well, why are you making me do it this way? Well, we did it this way before, or my old pitching coach taught me this, or my old boss said this was the best way. Why why is this the best way now, Brolin? And I have to be willing to take the time to uh, let them know why. Once they know why, bye. They are off and running off off to the races. And I think that that's such an important message. And again, giving that permission to yourself as a leader that you don't always have to be the one. It's kind of fun to not be the only one making decisions. It's fun to work with other people. We're humans. We want interaction and it's okay to have them lead. I love that. That's a hundred percent spot on. You know, the, the other thing it made me to, to just uh, add on to that. I, I can't remember what Papa wouldn't told me once. If you want to see how great a leader you are, let your players take over practice. And I can remember the first time I heard that and I'm like, oh, there's no way they wouldn't know how to do it. (laughs) And he says, well, whatever you think you're right. But it actually switched my mindset. Unfortunately, not until later in my career did I start to really take in on 
how I could be better. And thank goodness I had players, you know, I had players that trusted me enough to give me bad news. Right. You know, Roy, your, Roy, your sister, yeah. Tara Henry, <laughs> you know, I, I always say this, the disclaimer to all those sport parents out there, accountants and whatever else you're doing is the disclaimer is what's so funny. I'm not a parent. And then I'm, <laughs> I'm telling people how to be a sport parent. But what I did for 27 years, I watched parenting come across my porch called UCLA. Mm -hmm. And this is the one thing I know to be true. Parents that let their children figure out their own problems, let them figure out their own conflicts and let them fail and recover on their own. They then develop their own self-regulation, their own self-efficacy and their own self-confidence. And then by the time I get them, where there is a razor thin margin for error at UCLA. Imagine coming to a program where every year you go to the World Series and you better win a championship because every player that went through the program when I was coaching won a championship. Here comes Tara Henry, Rory's little <laughs> sister. She weighs like literally 98 pounds. I mean, you talk about a stick of dynamite. But she actually is a great profile where her mom and dad let her do her deal, own her stuff, held her accountable. So when she came in to this high standard, she's like, Brant, I, I want to get better because she already had a strong sense of self. Conversely, I had parents that had all their hands on that student athlete, best player in the country. I'm recruiting the best player in the country. She can't hold the pressure together because she's equating her success to her worthiness. Mm. Tara Henry, she knew if she went 0 for 3, she knew <laughs> she knew that her Frank and Mary and her brothers were going to love her up regardless. She had such a strong sense of self. And so to the leaders out there, to those people that are running unit business units, when you let them fail and figure it out and recover on their own, they will stay more committed to that environment and ultimately that company. And when you develop that in them and they have that self-regulation to be able to solve their own problems, problems. They're not only a better employee, they, you produce more as a company in terms of your KPIs, but most importantly, you're going to give them peace of mind, most likely for the rest of their career. Yeah. I love it, coach. And I know you worked with the U S men's Olympic team, and that was one of your main things you worked on was the failure recovery system. Uh, Karch Karai and the U S team hadn't won in a while and they ended up winning the gold medal. Can you talk about the work that you did with them? Yeah, I worked with, with the USA women's volleyball and uh, they had gone through 13 tries, 13 quadrennials where they got very close, uh, multiple bronze. They got uh, multiple, they got a silver and uh, they couldn't get over the hump. And yeah. I was asked to come in to help with the team cohesion. Now it's very challenging, right? You got the best in the world. They're ranked one, two, three in the world every year. The sport of volleyball has been around in the Olympiad for 60 years. But then in the same breath, we're going to say, but you also have to give to each other. Very, very similar to corporate America. We're all marching on your numbers. Q1, Q2, Q3, hit your numbers. But I need you to be a good teammate in the office. And so how do we navigate all that? Well, number one, we got to be uber clear on what we're saying as a company. We're all going to strive to be minute by minute, day to day. And how do we hold each other accountable? And how do we celebrate those performance skills and those relationship skills? Great culture is driven by two levers, how we perform KPI, Q1, Q2, Q3, straight rigid excellence doesn't negotiate. Here are your numbers. All right. We're not going to wiggle around it. You're not hitting your numbers. The other lever is relationships and how am I communicating in conflict and celebration and in support and loyalty to my teammates on a day to day basis? Well, I had noticed that we could really improve in these areas around what is clear. What do we all agree on? And so all of my work early on was anonymous polling. I needed to get a honest, objective opinion about what you love, what's holding you back, what's important to you. So we went in, we got their performance values ranked. We took their top three performance values. We took their top three relationship values, and then we created a matrix on those, telling us what it looks like, what it doesn't look like on the court, off the court. Mm -hmm. And then we celebrated 
everything through three big operational pillars. Number one, we're going to wake every day to be grateful that we're a 0.0001 percenter, that we've already made it to the top. And now we're on house money. We used to always say we're on house money. We're going above <laughs> and beyond. You're already representing the flag. Right. That Olympic medal is going to be a two-hour event that will be out of date the next day because everyone's going to be asking Karch about Paris. <laughs> but we're not going to live our life based on a two-hour event. We're going to live our life, the anticipation, the year delay in the pandemic to master our gratitude, to understand when we cross over into the grit. This is the game part. Your coaches are going to be really, really tough on you because they have a high standard because there's no wiggle room at the top. That's why they call it an apex of the mountain. And then last, and I think this was probably most impactful for them, was this idea of introducing grace. And grace, uh -huh. and was clearly defining grace, grace to yourself, grace to your teammates, and grace to your past. We needed to uh, unlink from the past tries and losses that we weren't able to get it done. The sooner we uncouple the past, giving grace, and I define grace, unmerited acceptance. So we have that high standard that's rigid. Remember my father said, excellence doesn't negotiate. We know that the, the standard is to get that gold medal. So that unmerited, we didn't reach it but acceptance. I'm going to accept myself every single day. I'm going to accept my teammates through loyalty and commitment. And I'm going to uncouple myself from the past because I can't do anything about that. So gratitude, grit, and grace in that order operationally to execute our performance character skills and our relationship character skills. And I think that helped us go through with this concept of 23 strong, meaning 23 started out, we ended up with 12 after cuts, but we took that 23 mindset that we all 23 were going to go into Tokyo. So when we went into Tokyo, we went in with 23 strong, not, not literally, but figuratively. And I think that weighed really heavy because we lost two people in the final, in the semifinals, two people went down and we replaced them and went through and just crushed it. And they'll have that for the rest of their life. Most importantly, those skills. Yeah, and you talked about mindset, and I'd love to talk about mindfulness here, Coach. Uh, you uh, you speak about the strong voice, weak voice, and it's a very powerful concept. Uh, I personally uh, have something, a mental model that I use uh, with my voices in my head. I actually created a back to the future mental model, and that weak voice is the Biff. He's the tyrant. He's yelling at me. You're not doing good enough. The George McFly is the guy who's unsure, right? But then also have the Marty McFly, who's the go-getter. He gets things done. Or the Doc, who's inventive, innovative and, and thinks of new things. So can you kind of talk about this strong weak voice, weak voice, uh, mental mindset? Yeah. And, and, you know, you talk about just being intentional. The one thing we have to remind everybody, we now know so much about brain science. And we now know that we can't control the thoughts that come in. We can't control the thoughts that come in. So I would love it to wake up and go, hey, Sue, you're going to have a really weak thought in about 30 minutes. Get ready for it so we can move through it quickly. But what happens with most of our student athletes and our young employees, some of them even veteran employees, we're letting all these thoughts come in and we're not organizing them to go left or right. And once you learn you can't control what goes in, you can only control where it goes. Most of our anxiety as a performer, an athlete, has to do with worrying about the past or worrying about the future. So number one, is this relevant? No, it's not. And then park it over here. Can't do anything about that right now. Be where your feet are. And how are you feeling about where your feet are right now? Oh, you're in the batter's box, bottom of the seventh inning. You're going to go, oh, hella yes. And then what we do is now we've put it on the left side of our brain. We've pulled in all of our inventory that we talk about Monday through Friday, loading up the inventory, loading up the investments, because I'm going to pull from those. So my strong voice has vernacular to talk about it in that moment where my feet are, because ultimately our best athletes, the best corporate performers I've ever dealt with, they have the intention. You probably ask yourself, what's Tally for? Well, Tally for is a tax flow that empowers firms to automate the tax trial balance, saving them hours per return in three easy steps. Import, adjust, and file. Import. Tally 4 accepts data from all major accounting systems. 
adjust. Your accounting and tax teams can collaborate to make all the necessary tax-based adjustments. And file. Once the tax trial balance is completed and approved, Tally4 can send it to any leading tax product. Tally4's import, adjust, and file process will help you reduce the time it takes to create a tax return from hours to just minutes. To learn more about using Tally4 for your CPA firm, head over to tally4.com. That's T-A-L-L-Y-F-O-R.com. They have the awareness to understand the thought came in, where do I go it, and then what do I do with it? And once they have that down, they can actually be their best. Are you going to win every time? No, because we cannot control winning. We can only control our character that drives our process. So our character, who we are, how we think, speak, and act, that's our character, drives our process, how we do work, the quality of the work, and our accountability of the work. And then we let the results take care of themselves. Easy to remember. I call it high-performance CPR. Your character drives your, res your results through the process. CPR, character process results. I love so, it. Rory, yes. I got a little something for you. All right. So one of the things in, in with that is so important. And with the mindset, whether again, like whether you're an athlete or you're in the office, your mindset is key. It's in the office, you're sitting there, you're going, okay, I have 200 tax returns. I have to be done within two months. Yeah. What am I going to do? So, so your ability to be prepared for that mentally is, is part of your job is to say, okay, this is busy season, right? That's what we call it, busy season. I like to call mine uh, prog progressive and progress and accomplishment and getting things done result driven because people will say, oh, Brolin, you're so busy. And I'll go, no, 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 I am productive. So for me in the, in the office and I have, if I wanna be a practice at 3.30 and I, I'm, you know, I get there first thing in the morning, my goal is, how many returns can I effectively, efficiently, and accurately prepare and complete before 3.30? And so there's a goal for me. That's I put it on the wall and I go, I'm picking these four returns or whatever it may be that day, right? And I say, okay, time to focus, put your phone away, put your, shut your email down, shut your Slack down. Nothing else matters right now, but those clients and their returns. And so that mindset of, being prepared to be in the in the batter's box, the same thing as being prepared for say a tax season or whatever that may be for you. Maybe you're in an audit, you're trying to complete something or you're putting together a, a portfolio package, whatever it may be. That's where that focus and presence where, where coach is saying where your feet are, be where your feet are, what's important now. That's what was important at that moment. You got to get that, those things coming, get them away. You can block those things as well by implementing a you know a peaceful quiet or for me I like really loud music that just blocks <laughs> out everything else and my brain can't think about anything else than what I'm doing which is how I studied in college they're like you're not studying you're in there playing music <laughs> no it's what focuses my brain and gives me the ability to concentrate which is weird right and so one of the other pieces uh, as you're dealing with these young people I think it's really important also to kind of point out Something, what, and I wrote the book, obviously, The Designated Motivator, and, and my journey through a single season, like we have tax season, we have softball season, soccer season, doesn't matter, whatever season, audit season, which seems to be all year round. But if you think about the people you're working, and one of the things that I learned to do, or maybe didn't realize I is the way I am as a human, because what I'm doing here with you is the same way I am with my clients in my office, in the absolute same way I am with those kids on the field. My, who I, the character that coach is talking about, my character is the same, no matter what I'm doing in my life, because that's my character everywhere. And that's great. So I realized as I'm working with young people, and I love to work with younger people, young adults, is that having an intentional, purposeful conversation that's meaningful, where you're actually looking at them and you're maybe noticing something about that individual where you see, we talk about maybe a certain subject matter and it, they start to listen. Oh, so-and-so is interested in chocolate milkshakes. I'm making it up. Whatever that topic may Sorry, be. Did you say that? Siri wants me to say it again. She wants me to say it again. So, which I understand. So when you find that intentional thing that either, you know, I use one of the examples is I, this one girl has the best dimples in America, I think. And dimples rule the world if you didn't know it. So this girl has these dimples and I would go up to her and I go, Julia, how many dimples do you have today? 
And I'm like, only one dimple, not a good day. What's going on? Where I had the ability to have that contact, that mental appreciation of them as people, but it was intentional. And I think in the workplace, it's really easy for us to be unintentional because we have emails and phone calls and texts and slacks and every communication tool that our brain has somehow adapted to and learned to accept the information. I don't think we manage it well, which is why I do the shut off. These kids have it even worse. And so Again, as you bring in these young professionals, they are, uh, they're just different than the way we did it, but it doesn't mean it's not any better. I say, don't fight it, join it. And that's what I decided to do. I see these kids not wanting to work 80 hours a week. And I said, you know, give yourself permission to do something different. And you'll be amazed, I think, by the results. The results are what have, like you said, the winning you can't control, but you can control an end game result when you have intentional purpose and attentional care and concern, compassion, empathy, those things that I think the technology eliminates a lot of times and we become numb to it when really that's what we want. We want someone to come up to us as we're maybe having a tough day and say, hey, what's up? You just don't see something's off. Let's go sit down. Let's go come in my office or let's go, let's go take a walk. That's a great idea. You can actually leave the office people, by the way. You can actually leave the physical building and go outside during the day. There's your permission if you didn't have it before. So, you know, but having that ability to relate to them, to people as people, is something that we've been losing. And we actually need it now more than ever before. And so how to motivate your team, how to motivate your office staff is to be more present and intentional as you're leading and growing and, and doing those things that you're trying to do as a professional, and then give yourself permission to do things like take walks and let them take walks, by the way, they become more productive because busy is no good. <laughs> and also you want to be able to systematize a listening environment. So one of the things that you always want to be able to do build in your environment is a system that will sustain itself if you're gone. And many times when you see programs, they'll be very good. And then the leader leaves and it's not sustainable. And that's a, a red flag for needing to build a better system. And that even means being proactive. Like I'm, I'm going to uh, share with you what one team does. They have the black box. It's a Google questionnaire at the end of every week, what'd you love? What didn't you love? And how can we make it better? And it's a proactive approach to them building their own culture. And your job is to hold space for them to identify it and for them to go ahead and solve it. It's super important for leaders that are feeling tired. If you're feeling tired, you may not have a environment where you're having the colleagues do the work and the onus is on them to build a culture where everybody feels like they're a part of how it's supposed to be. And, it, and I can't feel that if you don't give me the power to fix it or to contribute to it. Yeah, I mean, we have great performance management softwares out there. We use 15.5. I don't know if you use it, Don. Uh, it talks about recognition. Uh, you know, it goes over feedback. And so it allows us to build a team. And, and, and I feel... Uh, that I can talk to my superiors and and give them the feedback that I'm looking for, and they can give me encouragement or recognition uh, for what I'm doing. So, you know, I, I, that's a great tool that we use uh, at the family office. Yep. Yeah, yeah, and those things are important. Like people, you know, I think people want to be recognized. People want to have worth, and whether it be, you know, we're always what is it? You're always weak at the your weakest link. You're the you're the strongest at your weakest link, Sue. Is it something like that? You're only as strong. Okay. That's you're it. only as strong as your weakest link. And that's just as much true in the office as it is anything else. And I think some, and that's hard in an office. It's hard in an office when you have someone who's a, a, an executive assistant or an assistant to someone or a bookkeeper versus a tax preparer. There's this inherent uh, hierarchy of, well, I'm a CPA and you're a bookkeeper. So, and that's not the case. I actually personally, think it tips a little bit the other way. And I say that because the work that a bookkeeper does is 
absolutely critical to the work that a tax preparer is going to do. And I mean in that not compliance relations, but yet a bookkeeper who is a great bookkeeper, and you want to build them up over and above anything, because without good books, we have bad business. We have bad business because we're not making good decisions because we don't have good data. We can't get key metrics. We can't get evaluations and analytics and you know, FP and A. We can't do that financial planning and analysis if the books aren't good and they're two months late, which is in our industry has been historical data. Well, guess what? We need futuristic data. We need to know where we're going. We've always needed to know where we're going, but those bookkeepers, we want to build them up as best we can was because without them, we're not able to do these financial planning analysis or finance or, or tax planning or investment wealth management without those people. So we have to be present and know that there is this inherent, I don't know what is hierarchy is all I can really call it, but it, we have to make that not be there because that's not the case. One isn't better than the other. We need each other all just the same as anything else. So I think in the office, that's something that we can get better at and improve on. And at the same time, you know, you have a very rigid uh, industry, right? There's not a lot of wiggle room on an Excel sheet. I understand that. And so to your point around culture, culture is about how we go about the Excel sheet. And so I was working with a company, they, they had started something I thought was really interesting. Everybody's overwhelmed, but everybody's not overwhelmed at the same time. And they started a free agency that you could put your name in the free agency every week where you look at the schedule and you're like, I'm feeling pretty good. I'll be up for a free agency in the industry, in their business units where they share similar skills. And if you start to feel overwhelmed instead of trying to be, oh, I can do everything. And then you're completely a clown car and you hit your deadline. You actually can reach out to the person that says, I'm a free agent, meaning I'll, I'll come and offload some of the work for you to do the medial things that need to get done so you can get the bigger stuff finished. And then they started tracking the person that logged the most hours and they were recognized. And for us, we I call that above and beyond. We had a stat yeah. amongst our coaches and it was an AAB stat. And that was our tiebreaker on when we couldn't make decisions on who's going to be in the eight hole, who's going to be in the seven hole, tough decision. Oh, she's hitting 211. This one's hitting 218. She's got 19 RBI. She has 17. Eh, you can't really discern. What's the AAB stat? Who's the person that's coming early and staying late? Because they're the ones that have built up that self-inventory that they're going to be able to draw on that in that hot moment, that moment where it's you versus them. They're going to go, oh, heck yes. I worked my tail off to get here. I'm picking me. So that AAB stat above and beyond, we actually started recognizing that, which is a little bit unorthodox, just like I did with USA Volleyball. I challenged Karch that everybody in the country could probably pick the top six out of 12 Olympians. The hard work is Olympian number 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. Out of those six, who are the last three? And I literally believe those have to be your best teammates. Well, if everyone is espousing teammateship matters, why aren't we judging it? Why aren't we evaluating it? Why aren't we recognizing it? And that's what we did. We built a data bank of teammateship scores. And when it came down to it in the 11th hour, there was one player the coaches couldn't make a decision on. They were literally completely on opposite sides struggling. And they said, you know what? Let's take a look at the teammateship. And that person that ended up getting picked had, uh, she had 17 out of 18 votes. So on the player level, it was a no brainer. They knew who the best teammate was. So I challenge companies out there to start measuring those intangible things and give people an opportunity to go above and beyond recognize them, help each other. Cause once again, that's building the culture. What are those, some of those intangibles coach that we can recognize and, and, and have metrics for? Yep. Um, and so what we did is I have a glossary. It's mm -hmm. got like, uh, we've got like 48 uh, character skills that are broken down into performance skills. Performance skills are skills that get you to the top and you don't need other people. Think uh, work ethic, grit, uh, all the things that I don't need anybody. But then the relationship skills are skills that I need other people to, to make me be that. So think empathy, 
think sacrifice. Uh -huh. It involves other people. Most people are focused on performance that gets you to the top, but it's actually the relationships that keep you there. So what we did is we ranked those. Then we said, what does it look like? And then at the end of every week, we were ranking who was doing a great job in our values. So your values could be different per team. So USA Volleyball, they, their performance values were mental toughness, accountability, and competitiveness. And their relationship skills were trust, love, and honor. And so we built out a matrix to rank them one to, five, one to six on that, and everybody got a score, and they were ranked. Now, people are going to go, well, what about that number one player that's just a horse's ass? Well, as I said to you, you have to have talent first. Yeah. We're trying to get clarity when you're trying to make decisions at the very end. And we know you've got to have people that understand what it means to be a good teammate because not everybody gets to play every day. Yeah. And yeah. it seems that there's a spectrum there, coach, between performance and relationship. And there could potentially be a tug of war between those two attributes. Like how, how, do, you, how, do, how do you work as a, uh, as a leader and make sure you can have uh, those at equilibrium uh, regards to performance and, and, and relationship? Well, there's, there's a spectrum when it comes to evaluation. There's a spectrum, right? Because yeah. one person may be getting a six, another person may be getting a three. So you first identify what the values are. Then you identify what it looks like in the workplace because that allows people to pass judgment based on what the people say is important. I'll give you an example. In the office, there may be 20 things that need to get done that aren't on anybody's job description. And so if we start identifying, hey, make sure that we keep the office clean. Well, that's not in anybody's job description. But if we start saying that's part of being a good teammate in our performance skills, that's what it looks like under awareness. So for us, it was very specific. Here's the glossary. Pick the top three here, the top three here, define what it looks like in the office, and then measure it and celebrate it. Measure it means I'm going to judge it and celebrate it. Those names that are at the top are going to be celebrated because I think that's why we have issues in, in sports. We're all about, oh, life lessons, life lessons, crap on the life lessons. <laughs> Until you start to reward the coach for developing great culture. I'm not rewarded as a coach. My boss never said, hey, Sue, develop a great culture and you're going to get a bonus. No, it said, make them graduate, win lots, and you get to keep your job. What happens if we flip the script and we said, we're now going to have culture scores. You know, there's companies right now, Humanex out of Michigan. Mm -hmm. They'll come in and give you one score as a team. Now all of a sudden everyone's like, wait a minute, I want to get a better score mm -hmm. on our team. And then people will start looking outside of themselves and say, what does the team, what does the environment need that may not necessarily be about me? Yeah. I mean, I love quantifying culture. I mean, because you know, historically we just had great leaders and they had great culture, but we didn't know why. So providing those, those values, those attributes uh, can really elevate the performance of a, of a company. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, all right. So let's go into failure. I know you talked to it about a couple of times. Uh, can we talk about the intersection of failure and success coach? And, and I, I think you said um, failure uh, recovery system as well. Yep. A, a failure recovery system is one where I wish we were better at that today, but because I, I love our parents, but because they love their children so much, their first instinct is to protect their Thanks. children from any sort of, of embarrassment or struggle. And what, it's happening in the long run. They're actually holding them back from developing their own failure recovery routines. Even at UCLA, we, we had a station, uh, what was called the bucket drill. And my purpose for that was for them to actually practice failing. They didn't know that. They just thought it was a super hard drill. And the bucket drill, the infielders, that first baseman would literally sit on a bucket, have her glove right here, and she didn't move her glove. So you'd notice that they would fail nine out of 10 times. And they would go through two pats of the chest, give the outs, point to a teammate, and build uh, a routine that taught them to move through the failure and own the failure, that 
if you just failed in this moment, you're not a failure as a person. So we had to teach them to separate that. Some people came in, they were raised in a way where they knew their failure wasn't going to define their character. So that to them, it was no, it was an easy drill. I'm going to fail a lot. I'm going to own it and move on. Others were in tears their freshman year because yeah. they'd never failed that much before. So I knew those were going to be people that were heightened. Those were people that I was going to really have to put in the cooker. So by the time we got to Oklahoma City, where the World Series was, they had built up what I call a competitive callus, that they could take the blows of failure. You have employees out there that need to learn how to take the blow of that Q3 report, yeah. own it, find out how to get better, and create an IDP, an individual development plan. If you're not doing that, oh, you have discipline problems, then ask for an accountability partner. Sounds elementary, but if you're showing me you don't have the discipline to adjust and adapt, then I'm going to have to get you a partner to help you. And I, I work with companies right now that have uh, accountability partners. So they can in pairs and in groups, because we know Gen Zers, they do really well in groups. They like yeah. to be in groups. They don't want one, one captain. When I grew up, Rory, I was always raising my <laughs> I want to be the one. Today, nobody wants to be the one, but they'll be in a group. group. And so what happens is that's not helping them own individual failure. We want to be great at failure because we're going to fail a lot in life. So you're saying Gen Z, they're having maybe the struggles with uh, they struggle the yes. because of this group mentality, this this idea that the way they were raised for many of them, they weren't put in a safe, emotionally safe environment where they were celebrated for their accountability. So as you know, you could bring any of my student athletes and they would say, oh, my God, Sue was so <laughs> unreasonable. Right. But they all knew that I would be around their pinky if they just mastered effort and attitude. So I never demanded a 400 batting average, but I demanded a positive attitude and hustle after failure. And if you learn that, I was easy to play for. If yeah. you didn't learn that, I was a nightmare to play for. And I find that players today struggle because they were never in an environment where they were taught how to fail. And so they thrive in the excuse world blaming everybody but themselves. You meet their parents. The parents are blaming everybody but themselves. So, you know, the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. We've got to change that because by the time they become a young employee at 23, 24 years old, that's going to stick out. All I know is somebody like you, Rory, you've got people working for you. You want that person that comes early and stays late, works their tail off, is a good teammate, and when they fail, they can look at you in the eye and say, that's my bad. I did these three things wrong. These are the three things that I'm going to fix it. Pick me up in two weeks and let's reevaluate. Re that employee, yeah. you're going to do whatever you can to keep them. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I do improv. So I, I have been callous to failing. I fail on stage all the time. And I'd be okay, okay with it uh, to go on stage and not get a laugh. Okay, you know, it's fine. Move on to the next scene. Yep, exactly. And just like a callus, right? You, you can't, you can put as much super glue on it as you want and cut corners on trying to create that callus, but that super glue is going to come right off. The only way to build the callus is to go through that preparation and that training. And that's, but those are the things that are timeless is effort and attitude is timeless, but how you do it today is a little bit different. Do you have to have, you know, fun day with the boss? at two o'clock on Thursday, because it's the day before Friday, you might have to do that. Does the boss have to be on the hot seat just like an athlete or a, an employee to get to know the boss? Probably, I would coach yeah. so differently than when I coached in 06 because the environment is different now for our student athletes. Yeah, what you said, this, the hot seat, can you? Uh, yeah, the hot seat our, is yeah. something that we did when we were recruiting student athletes, we brought them in, we put them on the hot seat, put them in the center of the room and we wanted everybody to get to know that athlete. And we had like little rules. You couldn't talk about softball. We wanted to talk about your family. We wanted to talk about your values. So we would say, you know, Roy comes in, Roy, we're recruiting Roy. Roy, thank you for coming. We'll put you on the hot seat. Roy would sit down and we'd say, who was your favorite elementary school teacher and why? Now, what we're learning is what they were paying attention to. And you find out a lot of things about people when you say, can't talk about softball. I love it. I love it. Don, do you have any more questions for Sue here? 
Well, I have a million questions. <laughs> I mean, you know, can you just, would you mind just coming coaching with us just one <laughs> and just help us get over that hump? All those, what's, what I do love about coach is that she's always open to, to give her cell phone number out. She's always open to talk to people if they have questions and what she's done, you know, just in general for the industry is, is beyond something that I ever imagined. And I, I feel that there's so many coaches that need to hear that, including me, right? As somebody who's actively in, in the co collegiate coaching world. And, and yes, the, the, to see these kids not be able to adapt or not be able to um, more, like you said, it's, it's almost like it, 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 they've been enabled to excuse. They've been enabled to have excuses. And this teacher did this to you. And why didn't they give you an A? And I actually did the project half the time, meaning the parent. The parent is like, it's like they're covering them with a blanket to protect them from everything that's out there. I get that. I'm a mom too. But at the same time there, I've made some really hard decisions to say even, and this is something that even just as a leader, you know, like I pushed my kid out of the nest when she was going to go to college. I said, you're not staying here. There's nothing here for you except because I don't want to let you go. That's not okay. Right. right? So I said, you know what, Em? Off to Washington, D.C., six-hour drive. I can't get right to you. Dropping them off is really hard. And then when she calls and complains about a grade or whatever may happen, you want to get down there and beat up the professors. Like, that's a natural thing inside you as a protective. But at the same time, I knew I would do her a disservice by not doing to them. So understand that where these kids have been, and, what, and it's again, it's not a blaming game. It just is what it is. So what you do, like you say, Sue, control the controllables. That's not one of them. You can't control how your employees have been brought up in the profession or even brought up through school or brought up through whatever it is. You can't change that about the past. But what you can do is groom them from here to the future. And coach, what you have to say, what's so great that it does relate to not just athletes, but it relates to the business world so strangely directly. It's so strange to me how interrelated the two are because it's life. But being able to recognize that, know what you can control, and this is something important for leaders in an office, there are things you can control about people, and there are things you cannot control about people. So if you know what those are, knowing you can't change the past on whatever that may be, but the even more exciting thing is that you can change their future in a way that they never even imagined was possible. So being able to encourage people that come to you, and, and here's a simple example of, you know, someone comes to you and they may have reservations about their ability and, and like maybe they want to be a tax preparer and they're already uncomfortable. I'm in a new firm. I don't really feel really confident, but I feel like I can get it if I got some mentorship and I got some, you know, a buddy that would actually be encouraging me and teaching me as opposed to an experience that I had, which was I hand a tax return and I got an F <laughs> on it when I got back to the office. And I'm like, that worked for me because I'm a competitor in every single part of my life. Every part is a problem. And I was just in a competition with myself. It wasn't with them. It was, you know what? I got an F. I'm getting a, a D next time. And then the time after that, I'm going to get a C. But not everybody can operate in that competitive environment. So we have to be able to say, okay, this person has great potential. There, I can, as you said, coach, you can talk to them and learn about their lack of confidence just by looking at them on the hot seat and saying where they're like, especially as freshmen, especially as first, first year, second year professional you know, you guys are so experienced. I, you know, I watched you play or I've heard of you before or whatever it may be. And there's this intimidation. You can see that in the hot seat. So imagine how they feel when they're in the office trying to be perfectionists at their tax return preparation or at their bookkeeping or whatever it is they're doing that you may need to be that motivator. And if you're not, this is another thing. If you're not that motivator, if you're not that person, don't pretend to be it. And guess what? That's okay. So what do you got to do? You have to enable others who probably have that within them, but might be intimidated by the fact that you're the boss. Well, I don't want to be the one that comes in and saves the day and encourages someone because I'm, you know, I don't want to step on anyone's toes, but rather be that leader who has that take your door literally off the hinges and throw it and say, seriously, come in, go see them. Don't expect people to always come to your office. Go be part of 
the cubicles. Go be one with the cubicles. Sitting in your office is not necessarily going to be the best answer for everybody. So embrace that and have fun with it as much as you can if you're not that open outwardly maybe you're somebody who just likes to you know sit in your own office and be the boss and click some keys but go be with them and if you're not that person find someone who loves to do that and enable them to go and be that motivator to be that encourager and that support for those people and so that's just another realization that not everybody's going to be like coach Pepin is not going to be that person that's not who she is she was smart enough to find somebody else who could do that for her team she realized her, that wasn't who she was. So sometimes as leaders, we have to realize that's not me. So we're not doing that. No, it's not me. I'm going to find someone who can, or who wants to do it. And also today's generation, they want to connect. Yeah. They want some, so whether you're demonstrative or you're quiet thunder, you can, uh, you can accomplish that connection by just paying attention to your people and setting up schedules. I was talking to a VP yesterday and he was in an interview and people were saying, how do you make them feel so connected? He says, I'm actually not a connector. And so uh, I'm a loner and I look at connecting as a necessary tool. So I'm actually more disciplined than I am connecting. And I build it into my calendar. So he shows the calendar that has like 40 slots every day where he tries to go and just tap someone's shoulder and just say, hey, I just want to thanks for coming to LPJ. That's all he does. Yeah. So unprovoked gratitude, we know, is one of the most powerful, whether it's demonstrative or quiet thunder. Yeah. I'm a big fan of Mark Golston, UCLA psychologist, who's in a book called Just Listen. <laughs> you know, Just Listen uh, is a great book and it's helped me out throughout life and, and having empathy and, and putting myself in on someone else's shoes. So uh, I'm a big fan of UCLA's Mark Golston. Uh, Sue, the coach, thank you so much for coming on the you podcast. If, uh, if there's an organization out there that wants to bring you in, which I highly recommend, what's the best way to get a hold of you? Oh, uh, it's pretty easy. Just uh, shoot me an email. It's Bruin. B-R-U-W-I-N-06 at Gmail. Um, that's the best way. I work directly. I don't go through an agency. I get to pick my projects. So I'm really fortunate, Rory, that to be at a place where I can do the things that I'm passionate about, which is stuff like this. Um, and Rory, I just want to take a minute um, to just say to you and your family, what an incredible, impactful family you were in the legacy of UCLA. And it really starts from the top with your mom and dad. They were so classy. They were so much fun, but they had this foundation of character and high standards. And I see it in you and I see it in the rest of your siblings. So I just wanted to take a public moment to be personal with you, to let you know how much I appreciated all your support through the years on our best days and our worst days. Yes. Thank you, Coach. I enjoyed being a super fan. The Four Horsemen. I love the Bruins. That Four Horsemen story. I mean, come on. That's pretty amazing. <laughs> I know. I heard they on the World Women's College World Series, they, they referenced back to the Four Horsemen days. You know, we always talked about being positive and not being negative or heckling the other team. We only want to be positive uh, for the Bruins. And we want to uplift them, uplift them and hopefully give them an advantage out there in the playing field. And, and then this, my favorite story was when Ben Affleck bumped into one of the four horsemen in the yeah. supermarket and he was getting the side eye and Ben Affleck says, are you, are you one of the four horsemen? That's my That's favorite right. story. That's <laughs> right. That's right. Um, it was Matt. He, he bumped into Matt. Since you're yes. Boy, aren't you? <laughs> yeah. Sorry. We're going off the rails. Sorry yeah, about that. All good. <laughs> uh, Coach, thank you so much for coming on. Don, you're great. Thank you for coming on. If, if, anyone, if anybody doesn't know who you already are, what's the best way to get a hold of you? Yeah, just go to my website, dawnbrolin.com. Yes. You can email me at, at uh, dawn at powerfulaccounting.com. I love to help prof- other practitioners just be the best they can be for themselves and their team. And I mean, Rory, honestly, like I get a kick out of you. I think you're fantastic. <laughs> Your energy, like I could explode, I think into a million pieces right now. And just, I'm honored that you would, first of all, let me on your podcast. That's number one. But, but with Sue Anquist, when I got the email, I almost came out of my shorts, man. I was just like, <laughs> what? Like my world, my, I felt like, like my whole life flashed in front of me and my worlds collided. The passion I have for accounting since I was 16 and the passion I have for the game of softball and what it does for young ladies and, and what it does for 
for even old people like me, old ladies like me. Um, I'm honored, Rory. I, I will never be able to thank you enough. And Sue, oh, nice. I'm, I'm going to go listen again because I can learn a lot more from what you said when I can sit down and write it because you just, you change the lives of so many people and you do it so eloquently and so giving oh. just with all of your soul. And it's, you even remembered who I was, which I just felt giggly and honored to be honest. It was just, it was just fun to see you and, <laughs> and, and, and be together with you. And I appreciate all the work and uh, mainly your commitment to our industry. And the fact that you're also a smarty pants dealing with the numbers. <laughs> I mean, talk about a win-win. <laughs> you're the best. Bud. All right. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Everybody. Take care. Take Bye-bye. Care. All opinions expressed by Rob Santos and Rory Henry on this website podcast interview are solely their opinions and do not reflect the opinions of Arrowroot Family Office, LLC, or their parent company or affiliates, and may have been previously disseminated on television, radio, internet, or another medium. You should not treat any opinion expressed by anyone as a specific inducement to make a particular investment or follow a particular strategy, but only as an expression of their opinions. Past performance is not indicative of future results.